I'm an honorary research fellow and have been working with the foundation for the last three, just over three years, three, four years. Um, and in particular, bringing my experience and understanding around processes of transformational change, um, not just in church contexts, but in other contexts as well. Mm. And you've brought quite a lot of the learning mm. about Theory U, which we're looking at in week two of Changing Church course. And interestingly, um, Theory U, when I started the work of transformational change, if you like, uh, systemic change in particular in the South African context, theory you hadn't been conceived of. Mm. So my interest at, at that point was particularly around disadvantage um, and the ways in which we did not in a university context uh, um, acknowledge and flourish students who came from very different backgrounds, non-traditional backgrounds. Mm. And um, our curiosity as an institution was how to become a learning organisation. Mm. And my particular research and practical focus um, in certain faculties, starting in the Faculty of Medicine, mm. was how do we create an inclusive learning environment for students from second language, other language, other cultural backgrounds, mm. um, and integrate them well into a mainstream, largely Western curriculum, for want of a better word. And I think it was that exploration that helped me understand that if you're looking at a whole system and how to bring about and create a learning environment, uh, you need to shift some fundamental assumptions about who owns knowledge, um, where learning happens, and continually framing African students in particular as disadvantaged or underprepared or poorly prepared and constantly focusing attention on them and how to build their academic literacy skills and other capabilities rather than looking at the curriculum in its entirety and the teaching and learning process in its entirety was never going to work. Mm. So I at that point embarked on systemic curriculum transformation work and worked with 15 specialists to design a problem-based learning-oriented and inquiry-based program in the Faculty of Medicine. Mm. And we were working at that point quite closely with Peter Senge, mm. who is associated with MIT in Boston, um, on what are the conditions for bringing about systemic change. Um, and I think that really got me on this path, if you like, for understanding that if we're wanting to bring about transformational change um, that is equitable um, and addresses some and redresses past imbalances, historic and other imbalances, um, then we need a very different approach to change and how we work with it. I then I subsequently moved to Australia and it was in that context that I continued my association with MIT, mm. but Theory U had been, was, was an evolution of the early work around learning organisations and how do you create learning environments. Um, and so my work with Theory U and other practitioners continued at that point. And it might be worth, I know we're going to talk a little bit later about what do we mean by Theory U. So perhaps I'll leave it at that okay. at this point. No. Slide seven of week two actually gives a diagram of the movement of theory U. Can you take us through that so that we understand it more? I think I'll start with a metaphor. And, and this also comes from my early work. Mm. We talk about what, you know, it's, it's in, in theory U language, we are actually cultivating social fields. And that's more than social systems. Um, and what I mean, and, and maybe the metaphor that is helpful here, if you think about organic farming, mm. a farmer doesn't drive a plant to grow. He constantly pays attention to the quality of the soil. He's constantly creating the conditions for a living organic system to flourish. Um, theory you would claim that social systems are entirely comparable with natural living systems. And in the say, so why are you process? I mean, because that's an interesting question as well. It's because we tend to know what, we think we know what problems we face. We tend to, we, we think we know as society, we think we know as church, mm. what problems we face 
and therefore we have fairly immediate solutions, mm -hmm. many of which have been tried over many years with very little success. Mm -hmm. um, and theory, you would suggest that the movement of change is actually an inner journey of transformation. Mm -hmm. So, and why the shape of a U is because there's a necessary movement of release, letting go, in order for something new to emerge that is not a repetition of the old. Yeah. So, I, I think it's a very apt metaphor, that, that one of cultivating ecosystems, and it requires a different way of listening mm. and a different way of attending. So, at, at the heart, mm. um, and the act, the act of leadership in this case is one also of creating the conditions for a different kind of listening. Mm. So Theory U uses the language of the success of anything that you do in the world mm. is a function of the interior condition of the person who's intervening in the system. So the soil is the situation in which the plant can grow? And it's an entire, it's an entire context. So, I mean, I'll give you an example of where I use it and then I'll come back to talk a little bit more about the diagram. So I worked for many years as social process advisor to Catholic Earth Care mm -hmm. in Australia. And the agency was set up by the Australian Catholic Bishops Commission, or Bishops Conference, um, to create an ecological conversion in the Catholic Church in Australia. And they understood that Organisational structure by itself is never going to bring about conversion. Mm. Once again, it was how do you create the conditions for, for people to come to that realisation themselves. So Theory U is about really how do you shift from a very individualistic way of engaging with organisations, engaging with your role in an organisation from, an from an ego perspective to looking at an ecosystem and your role mm in an ecosystem. So the movement of the U journey is very much, if, you, if people will be looking at the diagram, it's very much moving from what in theory U language would be called downloading, which is habitual ways of looking, habitual ways of listening, habitual ways of seeing the world, to a much deeper understanding and appreciation of your role in the context of the system. So social fields, are those things that we enact and create together mm. and can a be social different. Field is. Well, a, a, social, a social field it is the communal resource that we're actually creating together. Because very often in organisations, people try and reorganise and restructure in, a, in order to achieve change, but they don't shift behaviours and they don't shift practices. Um, so I think that the movement that the U journey describes is one of opening the mind, opening the heart and opening the will. And by that, um, and it's, it's obviously it's quite a complex process and people will be reading more about it. Um, but that, that movement of opening where you're not simply downloading past patterns, but where you're noticing difference and engaging with others and empathising with others. So the opening of the mind is actually being exposed to things that might challenge your assumptions. Your assumptions about church, your assumptions about how things function and how they operate, to opening the heart, which is actually empathising with others, understanding their role, their perspective in, in a system, in the social system, and opening the will to understanding really your calling and vocation. And if you look at the root words of leadership from coming from Leith, it's, it's crossing a threshold. So that movement of the you is the let, a letting go in, in order to let come something that is not yet here, something that has not yet been born, which requires a suspension of ego. So that cross, crossing of a threshold is in some form a way of dying, yeah. because it's a dying to a, to a small sense of self and understanding that you are actually part of something much bigger. So understanding your role is not just your, your job description. So who am I and what is my work? It's understanding your calling. And why it's so appropriate for work in the context of the church, it's understanding that we are not willing change. So it is not our will. So if we talk from a practical theology perspective on earth as it is in 
heaven. It is that movement of we're not driving change and our organisational structures should, should be the vehicle or the means through which the will other than ours can be realised. And I, yeah, that's the movement of the you. Right at the bottom, there's that fascinating phase which is connecting to source. And we look at that quite a lot in week two. What is the connecting to source? What does it mean as, as far as you're concerned? Well, Christians would say it's connecting to God. Mm -hmm. um, all faith traditions would talk about surrender and that capacity to hold a will beyond your own, all contemplative practices would call for this. And in theory, you language, that is the, 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 the place of gener a, a generative space where something new can actually emerge. Because if you look at the things that stop the movement down the left side of the you, the voice of cynicism, so the voice of judgment stops the open mind. The moment you're judging and categorizing, the mind closes. The voice of cynicism closes the heart. Yeah. So the moment you're, you're in that space of closing and not empathizing and protecting, to that extent you're also not enabling something new to emerge. And the opening of the will, it's the fear of dying. It's the fear of actually releasing and letting go and surrender, surrendering. And why, in, a th in theory, you, at the bottom of the you, people spend a lot of solo time in nature, mm. is to actually connect with something beyond themselves. And in the context of Catholic Earth Care, we did a lot of work, solo time in nature, connecting with something much bigger than ourselves. Um, and to use the language of Martin Buber, to allow reality to emerge, not as we desire, but as it seeks. So that, that deep opening, is a very, once again, a, a strong theological call, which is why it's so appropriate to um, the movement of enabling transformation in whatever shape it, it comes. Yes. But it's not a case of driving. Mm. Power. How can it be used positively? Because so often it's used negatively. Well, if you think about change processes, we are constantly in the movement of change and power is a dynamic as part of that change process. There's, so there's always power. Um, in the language of organisations, there's always a tension between structure and agency. How do you empower people to act? How do you create the conditions for them to be able to make the real contribution that they've been called to make? Martin Luther King would use the language of power and love, drawing on Paul Tillich's work. So, and to use Martin Luther King's language, power without love is reckless and abusive, love without power is sickly and anemic. You actually need both. Um, and when you're working from an ecosystemic rather than ecosystemic perspective, power is holding your ground and being able to influence from that position, who am I and what is my work? is a critical part of bringing about systemic change. So if we're saying the interior condition, my own, the place from which I operate, is a critical part of bringing about a systemic shift, how you hold power and love together is absolutely critical. So it's never, then it is never a case of exercising power over. If you're thinking ecosystemically and you understand that your role is to actually advance the purpose of the system as a whole and your role is to create a social field an organic living ecosystem then you would you would be alert always to not using power in a way that is abusive thank you